We're live. We're live. This is so exciting. Sarah. Gloria, hi. Hi. We're just going to let people come in and then we'll get started. I'm, I'm, look, guys, this is the real. The great, the greatest part about being a showrunner is that I get to meet people I'm a legit fan of. And I've been such a fan of Sarah's for so long. And then when we met and obviously became very fast friends, um, I was so grateful for her partnership and and support out in the world of of just being a showrunner and somebody to go to. And then sometimes we get to do panels and talk and and uh, I've seen the third. Of course, I've seen the whole season and <laughs> and um, and I'm excited just to talk to you about things that they may not know, some things that I know and some things I don't know about you. Ask me anything. So people are still sort of trickling in, but I think I'm gonna look at all those people. There's like yeah, there's people. Hi, people. Three hundred twenty-five. Three hundred twenty-three. Hi. Hi, Megan. How are you? Yay! Hi. Hi, everybody. Oh my gosh! Great. Look at all these hellos. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so we're gonna assume. I'm gonna start this by assuming that you guys know who the amazing Sarah Gamble is and what she has done, but I am also gonna make her talk about it all. So I'm Gloria calderon Kellett. I am hosting today. I'm your moderator to talk to the amazing Sarah Gamble. Sarah, tell us about you, how you broke into TV, how television became something that you knew was a job. Uh, give, us, give us the origin story. I did not know TV was really a job when I was growing up. Yeah, I me neither. There were actors who were on TV, but I didn't know much else about it really. I grew up in the era of film was everything, you know, film and theater. I was a theater student, so yes. theater was everything. Um, Shout out to the theater students. Seriously. I, I started out writing screenplay. I started as an actor, actually. I think you and I have that in common. Yes, we do. Um, you know, I had always been a writer, but I didn't really think of it as a career per se, probably because I was mostly writing poetry and you definitely can't make any money doing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's just my therapy. And acting is what I'll do to be practical. I don't know what it is. Yes. yes. Um, but I was, uh, you know, I was writing work to perform. And um, through a play I was doing, I met uh, Ryle Tucker. And she and I were writing partners for years as we were trying to break in. She is also a showrunner. She, her show, The Power, just premiered. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Isn't that great? Yes. Um, so she and I would meet at 10 a.m. sharp at the kitchen table every morning, and we would write for two hours, and then we would read each other stuff. And we started to put our scripts into competitions, and one of them was Project Greenlight. Yes, I did Project Reality Greenlight. Show. Have we ever talked about this? No, have we not talked about Have we not talked about this? <laughs> Maybe not. I've, I mean, I told the story before, obviously, but yeah, I, I broke in on reality TV. I love this so much. So you guys got in. Yeah, we were in the top 10 and then we were in the final four. And what that meant was that we were going to go to Sundance and we were going to have our first film pitch and it was going to be with Matt Damon and Ben Affleck on national television. Jeez, no um, pressure. Guys, for those of you that think it's pressure to pitch, that is pressure. I mean, people now say that I've seen a lot on social media where people are like, don't bother doing competitions. I don't know what it's like out there now, but that was the advice I was given back then was any excuse to tell people to crack open your script. So get into competitions just so you can tell them you're in the finals. And in this case, you know, we had a, so we had a comedy script. I thought I was a comedy writer. <laughs> <laughs> you are funny. I mean, I crack jokes while I am disemboweling people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, we got an agent because we were going to Sundance to do this thing. Um, one of the lovely people who had seen us in this play we had done together was Joey Soloway, who had kindly shared their number with Rael. And I called them and I was like, what do you do? Like, what do you do? Do you know anyone? I can call their assistant. And they said, you know, um, here's the agent I would have if I didn't have an agent. It was this incredible woman, Sue Nagel, who has since- Oh my gosh, yes. Producer, and um, when she agreed to represent us, she was like, if you want really to see your stuff made, much less this year, if you want steady work, if you wanna really feel like you're in a, an office environment, which actually sounded pretty attractive to me at that point, 
I had been living kind of a nomadic life, mm. um, you know, a week to week kind of no mm-hmm. money nomadic life, mm-hmm. write some, some specs. So we just like wrote every kind of TV script and we, we did a thing called staffing season that used to exist. And because we had just been on reality TV, people were like, I want to meet them. <laughs> sure. Of course. Yeah. Oh my, I mean, that's such an incredible story. And it also speaks to, yeah, I think these days people do ask me a lot too about the competitions and I'm with you. I really do feel like anything to get anything to say you're, there's hundreds of scripts. Mine got to the top 10 of something or mine won something or mine. I think that gives you some sort of edge. I just feel like the, the place you can't take your eye off the ball is no one's going to just look at the list and call you because your name is on a list of finalists. Right. That's just your excuse when you have the guts to pick up the phone and call them or right. send the email and try and get through, run through the assistant gauntlet or right. whatever that's going to be. But the hustle is still very much <laughs> the real hustle. Yeah. Just, you know, it's a conversation starter, really. I think that's right. I think that's really great. Okay. So let's talk about um, how did this idea for you come about? Who, who initiated it? Did somebody come to you? Because it was based on a book? It's based on a best-selling now series of novels by Caroline Kepnes. I believe that Greg Berlanti acquired the book before it was published because he sent this little known writer, Greg Berlanti, perhaps you've heard of him <laughs> as a great future in television. Um, he, uh, he sent it to me and he was like, uh, I really want to write this and I need a, a co-writer. Just read it and tell me if you see what I see. It feels like binging an addictive TV show to read this book because it was mm. all in this character's head. Sort of like, you know, the voiceover on the show is the experience. You read one page of the book and it's like, whoa, I am really hearing what this guy is thinking. And the book did the trick on me that the show has the ambition to do on all of the viewers, which is, even though I kind of saw that he was a terrible person, he kept winning me over to his side. I found that very compelling, like, so I was not finished with the book. I just had sort of like started the book and I I called Greg. I was like, yes, for sure. Wow. And how true, because I've not read the books, but I've seen, obviously, binge the shows. Uh, How true is it to the book? How much did you, especially for that first season as you're establishing it and trying to figure it out and try to crack it as a as a show how true was it to what was on the page um I think season one is the truest season two is like has a lot in common with the second book and then spoiler alert at the end of season two you find out that um his beloved love Quinn is also a murderer and that's when we split off from from the the books since then there hasn't been much we sort of are in I call them parallel timelines, but um, the first book is the story of Joe falling in love with Beck and it ends where episode 10 ends more or less. But as you know, I mean, this is such a, it's sort of like a dumb thing to say out loud, but books are not the same (laughs) as TV and film. No, no. The, The experience, the thing that they have in common is that you can have a really strong emotional reaction that feels the same. Like you can read a book and feel like a great kinship with the character. And then people also feel that watching the show on TV, but the mechanics of how the writer is getting you there are totally different. So actually there's like a lot of sleight of hand that goes into making a TV show feel like the book you read. I agree. That's so well, of course that's well put because you're a a poet. You are a poet in how you speak. You put together words real pretty. I don't know if you're aware, but you do. I, this, we were saying this before we got on that like Gloria and I kind of have to do panels to see each other because she's so busy <laughs> running her empire. But now I remember why. It's so great to hang out with you. <laughs> <laughs> you put together words real pretty. Um, so yeah, so I think you're I think you're right in that there is a there is sleight of hand is such a great word because you need to make the audience feel from those that did watch that, that did read the book, you want them to feel that satisfaction too. And that probably is so difficult, especially because I'm assuming that the way the book is broken up is not 10 chapters and each chapter is an episode of the, right? You have to find a place to have like a beginning, middle, end of each episode and figure that out. Yeah. I mean, it was unusually helpful, 
actually as a book to adapt, Caroline had written a little bit of television and her brain really does think in story. Not all great novels even have the protagonist doing very much. You can read right. a whole novel where he's just on the escalator or something. Right. Um, but he was doing a lot of murdering people and throwing them in a cage and that was helpful. The, the book is entirely in his head, having this second person inner monologue. And so, um, you know, part of the trick of the book is that he's both being very honest with you and also a super unreliable narrator who's very judgy. So you're kind of putting together, like none of these people are actually how he sees them. Right. I need to read between the lines of his judgment to figure out who Beck really is. So part of the, the big difference in season one of the show was we had to create a character um, who sort of, she just like existed as the star of her own story versus being this sort of romantic projection that when she disappointed him, he had nothing but terrible things to say about her. Right. Yeah. Oh man. So talk, so talk through. So when you get it, you love, you read it, you love it. You call them up and say, yes, I'm in. Then what happens? Is it that you have to, did you have to pitch it? Did yes. you have to, you did tell us, tell us that, that process. And then into the writing of the, once it's a yes. And then the writing of a pilot. So it's what year is it? 2023. This yeah. was 2013 when he sent me. Oh, what? We pitched in 2014. This is why this is why it sounds like people are doing a lot of development when you talk to someone and they're like, Oh, I have these four. It's because we might be, it might take us 10 years. It's right? true. So it's true. Have like more than one. So we, we drummed up a pitch. We wrote, I always write a script out for myself. Um, sometimes the person I'm pitching with likes to keep it looser. And I'm just like, but can I just know what my cue is? Cause I feel best very prepared. Greg's stroke of genius was that he was like, we're going to stalk one person in each room. We're going to prove to them that you can find out anything about someone just on the social media that's readily available. We're going to have my assistant pick one person, probably not the president of the network, but someone in that room. And um, we're going to tell them all about themselves. So when we got to the part of the pitch where we were like, you know, privacy is dead. Let me explain what social media has done. Even if yours is private, your friend probably isn't. And then Greg would like whip out a page and he'd be like, Susan Rovner, let me tell you about where you get your hair blown out. And like all of this crazy stuff that we don't fit. So, I mean, there are probably places I'll never work again because I care about them doing that. But it was That's so I mean, effective. That's so smart. And what an engaging also, I feel like that's something that when you guys leave, they're like, that was really smart. That was, we've never seen that done before. I think it helps that, you know, if anyone who, I mean, I encourage people to Google Greg Berlanti and see any interviews that there are with him because he is such a sort of straight shooter and such a friendly person that it doesn't come off as psychotic when he does it. <laughs> the point was made. Wow. Wow. I love that detail. I love that. Okay. So then you go in, you pitch it, somebody, who, somebody buys it. Who bought it initially? Showtime. Showtime. And then you're off to script. Yeah. I mean, I think we jumped through the normal hoops. We probably had an outline, outline. and we developed it there for a year and we turned in the script and sometimes the nature of the notes you're getting kind of let you know that the direction they'd prefer is just not the same as the direction you want to go in. Yeah. And, um, again, I learned, I just sort of like jumped over 20 miles of, of crap I would have completely fucked up when I was working with Greg because he knows how to handle everything, right? I just learned it all from him, basically. Um, he's like, there is a way to part friends. There is a way to just say, we think that the show is this and you seem to think that the show is that and let's, you know, like, let's discuss that. And if that's the case, then maybe we can prep. So, um, uh, so, so we, we took the script back and we, um, went around again, did a second round of pitching, but this one, they read the script script first. This was, I believe it was the week Trump was elected. Oh my God. Um, I do have a memory of being in the lobby of maybe Amazon and Susan Rovner, who was at um, Warner Brothers at that time, was wearing a Hillary shirt. And we all thought Hillary was gonna win. And um, that was a crazy week. 
to be pitching because by the end of the week, obviously that's not what was happening. So we were right. putting our shit together and going into. <laughs> yeah. So. Wow. Wow. That's Greg good. Berlanti, Greg Berlanti, for those that I saw somebody come up and Greg Berlanti, who's done, if you don't know Greg Berlanti, you should look up everything. He has a thousand shows. <laughs> he is the most, I think, prolific. Producer. He's probably the most prolific right now, right? Maybe in history. Yeah. yeah. Maybe in history. He has a gazillion shows. Berlanti. He runs the CW basically. Yes. Hilarious. <laughs> um, okay. So you guys did that round and then what happened? Lifetime bought it straight to series. Oh my God. Great. It was a moment where they had just done Unreal. And so they were, which is a great show. Great show. Out. And um, they saw it really for what it was. In a way, we were subverting a Lifetime movie. Yeah. Uh, and they were all for it. They were pretty game, um, sort of cheeky, <laughs> creative partners. The only notes they had were about shoring up some of the female characters, which is a great note to get. And um, so we went, we went straight to series <laughs> and, um, it, we shot the first season in New York. Oh um, we got a pilot director to shoot the first two, Lee Toll and right. Cooper. And, uh, I had never shot in New York before. Which is tell wonderful. us about, tell us about the casting of Penn. I want to hear about that. Oh yeah. Um, well, we were seeing a million people. Of yes. Course. I mean, basically when you're putting together a pilot or a series, Number one on your call sheet, whoever that's going to be, that's the most important. There's a couple roles that you know are the most important roles. They'll make or break the show. So you're simultaneously auditioning a bunch of sort of up and coming actors. And then at the same time, the studio and the network or the streamer and your casting director is giving you these lists of name actors who are offer only. And you're meeting with them and you're talking to their reps. And so you're kind of doing everything all at the same time. And we had gone... I think far enough down the road with a couple of actors that we were probably setting up tests with them, test deals, which is when you kind of narrow it down and you start to work out what their contract would be, I guess is the shorthand. Right, right. That and then, um, you know, uh, Greg's partner, Sarah Schechter, I believe was like, you know, Penn Badgley is interested and would you sit down with him? And I just thought, oh my God, how perfect. Like no one will ever see it coming. He does Never. not seem like someone who would kill him. No way, that's the thing. That's the thing. Okay, so we have a couple of questions that I'm going to hit on before I continue, which is some people want to know what straight to series means. Right. So there's, you know, when we say something gets picked up, it sort of just means we are greenlit to the next step. So you can, you can um, go in and pitch something and they can hire you to just write a pilot script. And they, like, they can decide from that if they're going to pick it up to series. And, and when you and I started in the business, um, I think the, the pilot process was the most common process That's right. where you would write a pilot script and then they would pick it up to pilot, which means we would go shoot the pilot and then, and then all those locations and sets would go away and you spend the next several months cutting it and testing it. And, and then they would at a certain point decide they were going to pick it up to series, which is go shoot a bunch and we're going to put them on the air. Right. 10 or 13 or what, whatever the, the 22, I mean, in our day it was 22. Yeah, I did a couple 23 episode seasons. Back I right. did one season, 24 episodes of How I Met Your Mother. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, it was the old, the good old days. The good old days. I'm gonna say the straight to series thing. I'm gonna try not to be too uh, editorial when I say this because basically some of the stuff that is currently being discussed is I think a product of the fact that things go straight to series more now. Um, the pilot process, uh, by discuss now, I mean, our contracts are being just, you know, we're, right. we're, we're on the, we are taking a strike authorization vote today as we yes. have this conversation. Yes. Deal with it. Um, you know, the, the pilot process slowed things down in a way, let people assess what the show actually looked like and what they were going to be picking up because it's a commitment of tens of millions of dollars to make a season of TV and, or more. And straight to series is that's the model for a streamer that where you sort of drop all the episodes at once. It's, it, it, it's, it was before then more common on cable, which is what Lifetime was, where you have the pilot script and then they say, go shoot the whole season. So you open a writer's room, you keep writing and you, so you, you know, you, you, you may be given a little bit of extra time and money to make the first episode. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's all, 
you're just going to start and then you're not going to stop until the whole season is shot. And it's a little bit of a flex, I think, for people when they say they're picked up straight to series, but it's not an uncommon thing now. My little editorial yeah. thing is it is human nature, I think, for people to want to have more information to make decisions. And I think part of the reason mini rooms have become such a thing is because people don't want to pick things up straight to right. series. That's they right. Want, they want more information, so they ask for more scripts. Right. I mean, yeah. now I feel like, because One Day at a Time was picked up straight to series, mm -hmm. and that was such a gift. But now what they require is two scripts and a format document that's pretty detailed. And that's very in within the last few years being a very new sort of thing for for a for a writer's room and somebody's asking about the typical size of a writer's room what was the size of the you writer from season one six or seven writers for how big. for how many how many was it there was it 13 ten. it was 10 10 yeah i think six and then you know me and greg and um i don't mind a smaller room actually many of my favorite room experiences were were smaller rooms i know i don't i don't mind smaller rooms either the room size never troubled me provided we had enough pre-production to, to that i felt we could break the stories so you so picked up straight to series for lifetime you get your your writer's room i'm sure that was a fun room to assemble because you wanted what were you looking specifically for genre writers for thriller writers like what what was the process that you were looking to staff that room with? I was looking more, I, I didn't care so much what kind of experience they were coming in with. I was looking for a, a certain kind of um, like acerbic brightness in their sample. Ooh, acerbic brightness. Guys, could you love how this woman speaks? Like acerbic brightness. Like, oh, you know that, that I'm obsessed with you, Sarah. Thank you, it's mutual. <laughs> I mean it in a non-creepy way. <laughs> Um, but you know that thing when you're reading a script and you're like, oh, they went there. Yeah. Like, oh, they said the yeah. thing that- Yeah, how dare you? The, the how dare you moments, I call them, yes. Um, and, and then, you know, there's a lot of instinct that goes into putting together a room. You have to really think about how the pieces are gonna work together. Um, I thought more than I usually do about experience level because, um, you know, the, the strange thing that happened because it took so long for, so it took so long for you to actually get picked up that I did two seasons of another show in the meantime. Oh my God. The Magicians. Yes. It, it took so long for the Magicians to go. That's why I took the job writing the pilot of you. It was just this thing where I needed work. And there came this strange moment when you was picked up to series where I had another show at the same time. Um, so I knew that I wanted to, and this having two shows at the same time is very much a function of having great partners. Um, and having people who support you in, and like, you know, mm -hmm. it's like I had John McNamara on one side of the street with the magicians and he's a genius and he's been doing it forever. And then um, Greg, who has sometimes like 20 shows at the same time. I, I can't, I can't with Greg. I don't know how he finds, I don't know that he's human. He might be the alien mastermind that's come down here to make things better. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like if Dr. Manhattan instead decided to stay here and make- TV And decided I'm gonna just go to TV writing. <laughs> Yeah. Why um, save the world? I'm going to make them laugh and cry instead. I'll hit their emotions. So like one of my strategies was just to hire more people at upper level, hire people who had experience running a room because I was going to need to be efficient and only be in the room half the day sometimes. And I wanted things to be able to keep going. And um, it was, it was such an interesting pro Like, first of all, a lot of writers came in and told me stalking stories. Either hmm. here's the story of how I was stalked or here's the story of how I stalked someone. <laughs> oh, um, and so it was really entertaining. And I, I mean, every, I, I don't know. I, I mean, do you think about that as sort of like a puzzle you're putting together when you- Yes. I think that, I mean, the thing that um, that I think should let writers off the hook is that it's not just about being a good writer. It really is like, it's solving the showrunner's problem. And I think the sh I think us as showrunners are like, how can we gather, how can we assemble the Avengers of writing mm -hmm. of what we might need on any given day? So it's like, I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm oversee, I'm supervised. And it's also, what's that showrunner doing? Like you were literally had another show. So it makes total sense that you'd like, you'd be like, 
I need some upper levels in there because I don't know what's going to be happening. I want people who know how to do this. I want like, that makes sense to me. And then, you know, I'll always try to bring in somebody who's never done it before as our teacher, but like, I can do one of those. I can't have three writers that I'm teaching how to do this too, especially in the, in the days of these smaller rooms, there's, there's like one spot for like, this is the teacher. This is the person that we're going to, we like the voice. There's something there. Let's get in there with them. But yeah. then I need somebody who's a depend, and then it's the depending on the show and what I feel my strengths are versus what the the show needs. So it's like for multicam, it's like I need some joke people, a hundred percent. I need some people that can just crush story breaking. So when I'm off, they can keep the room going with story breaking. And then it depends on the show. For with love, I was like, oh, I'd love somebody that's just done one hour soap. Can I get one person in here for one hour soap so that I know because I've I've done that, but not as much as I've done the multicam. So I'm sure for you, it's what do you need to make the show that you've envisioned and that acerbic wit that, you know, those little pieces on the page first Mm -hmm. and then you assemble, okay, these are the scripts that I like. Now the people come in and that's just, are they, are you weird or not? Or uh, by the way, weird is not necessarily a bad thing. Can you play well with others? What's your vibe? Are you going to make me feel uncomfortable? Are you going to... Are you, are you good vibes? Are you good energy? Like, right. It's like you do this and then it's like, how, how much do we vibe? A hundred percent. Yeah. And there's only so much you can tell in an hour. So you just try to really make that hour count. But if you're getting an interview with the showrunner, it's because you got in the door because your script is good. A hundred percent. And if there are recommendations to be had, we've probably already heard them. Um, So it is a big deal to get the meeting with the showrunner. And uh, I mean, I hope people don't beat themselves up if they don't get that job because it really is what you're saying. It's like, if there's another person who's a lot like you, then it's like casting. You know how it's like super unfair? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that for writers on staff too. And there was a bit of, okay, you know, Mike Foley has been on a procedural and like, there's a a little bit of like, who is really good with the technicals of breaking a story and, you know, I, I remember reading a writer sample that was about a dominatrix and I was like, okay, this is like rated R and it's sex positive and that's good. And the, I, I knew that one thing I was pretty sure of was that the, the tone of the show and the, the content, the fact that we were doing kind of a cheeky subversive story about something that's actually very serious. So we had to ride that line where in a way it's like, the murder and the blood and guts and like killing rich clueless people that part is fun but the part where underneath it all this guy is violating women in every single frame of the show right, right. be really careful right because it's if you're glib about the wrong thing then suddenly this show is it isn't talking about something problematic it is very problematic right so, then, you know, the conversations were really interesting. Some of the best conversations I had were with male writers who were coming in with a lot to say about what sort of the effects of toxic masculinity are on boys. Mm. Ooh. Um, I mean, there was a moment there where our whole prospective roster for the writers room were women. And I was like, that's interesting. The, the whole show might be written by women. And then I met a couple of male writers who were just, who told me stuff I just didn't, I hadn't thought about about what pressure they felt as they were growing up. And I got very excited about that. I thought this can be a deeper show with these perspectives. Well, you know, and that brings up a good thing too. I also do the, what are the conversations that are gonna happen? Because some of the best stuff I think that ends up in script are fight, thoughtful and respectful disagreements and arguments that happen in the room. It's like, yeah. oh, this is, it. I like this. So let's talk this out and let's get to the other side of it because that's maybe where there's something to say. So it's also staffing the room, casting the room yeah. with personnel. So you don't, cause you don't want three of the same, right? Like you do kind of hope to have different perspectives. And I love, I love what you said about, is there a version of the show written by women that's great? Yes, but how great that you were like, oh, there's something there that I don't know and they can add. And I didn't think about it that way. That's that's really thoughtful and really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really have an agenda when I when I went in, but um, I did, you know, and the thing you're saying is really interesting because when there's a writer in the room who tends to disagree with me, like something about my perspective is making them nervous or 
rubbing them the wrong way or they just fundamentally have a different philosophy it's like as a person you might have this moment where you're like okay this person needs to un- like kind of just understand what we're doing here but but what i've learned over time is that's the writer to protect in the room it's the one who's disagreeing because it's not easy to disagree right with people and you really need that dissenting voice it's dangerous to have a room where everybody thinks the same so i'm all for people who are like um very not team joe or extremely team joe or or have you know deeper more um serious issues that they want to kind of hammer out in the writer's room for doing these episodes and I think there's an important distinction in what you said in terms of writer that disagrees, because the, I think the staff writer trope is the writer who's like, I don't love that. Uh-huh. And you're like, Okay, what's the pitch? If there's no pitch, then you don't get to not like it. <laughs> like, you cannot like it, but then I want 50 things of why you don't like it and what's an alternative to what it is, because then we're having a conversation versus I think staff writers get very excited to tell you what they like and don't like. And not yeah. all staff writers, I'm just saying that's mostly when I see it, is the staff writer that's like, I don't love it without giving, I'm like, what's the pitch? Okay, what's the pitch? You know, it's interesting because I see things, like the baseline for me is just serviceable. Does this make the grid of the storyboard work? And if we don't think it's an A+, plus, if it's a little cliche, we can go back, it can be a placeholder. But we're not going to take apart the scaffolding we're using to get to the final answer. Um, but, you know, people kind of dissenting because they're like, I think that what we're saying is not what we mean to say here. Like the, what, what, you know, the message of this episode, like how this character is acting feels like it's not the right, you know, that can sometimes that's like a more instinctual conversation, especially on a show like you, where we're touching on all of these things. Um, that are you know they're they are about just um well like a lot about just the relationship between the genders and mm-hmm. like what is romance and like what is acceptable and what are we going to be judging and um so there there does have to be room for people to be like I don't know why but I feel like there's yeah. something in what we're saying you know sometimes to just stop and come through that's fine. But there, I do have like a little asterisk for this point, which is sometimes it's that they, you know, a writer has a feeling that they're going to get eaten alive on Twitter. Oh, wow. For the episode. Um, we wow. About- that is, so, that's really interesting. But here's the thing. Any TV writer is eventually going to get eaten alive on Twitter or whatever comes after. You actually can't save yourself. <laughs> no, no, we're doing a very out there job. We're doing a job that's very out there. You're, uh, if you're going to write about anything of substance, eventually you're going to be a little controversial. So sometimes I, you know, every now and again, it's sort of like, yeah, but we're making a show that's talking about stuff people are going to have opinions about. And, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's that been true for my whole career. It's like, hey, we're writing an episode about sexual assault. Immediately, some people are going to be like, don't show sexual assault. Right. And so whoever's name is on this episode is going to get some tweets. And right. so part, it's a strange thing, but it is just true. In 2023, part of running a room is having a sense of when people's kind of instinctual issues are about the story and character and the message of the episode. And when it's like, we're saying something that's going to be controversial, you know? Wow. Yes. Yeah. So when did you, did you, or when did you feel you were ready to be a showrunner? Did you ever feel like I am ready to be a showrunner? Put me in the chair, put me in coach. I knew I wanted to be a showrunner when I heard what those were, which is when I started going out for staffing. I didn't mm-hmm. really understand mm-hmm. the hierarchy until then, because to me that meant you're telling your story. It's, it's, you know, it's a show that you've created or co-created to me, being a showrunner, which is all of the boots on the ground, million jobs, the responsibility and the logistics, and it's a lot of things at once, that's the price of admission to really have some level of creative control over a TV show. So I understood almost immediately that if you want to get your voice out there, if you want, if that's like the challenge you want to take on, then showrunner, that's the sort of brass ring for that. Um, 
And uh, did I think I was ready? I don't know that. I mean, no, <laughs> I've never been really? very confident really? about it. I, you know, I, you know what I do? I just like, I do this thing where I look around. I, I'm like, I have to hit manual override because I'm just a, like, that's just going to be my default. I want it to be perfect. I'm not ready yet. It's not going to be perfect. Do you think that's, but how much of that is like also just being a woman in this industry? Like we feel like we have to be perfect. A lot of it. Yeah. So what I do is I look around and I find, you know, four to 16 mediocre men, my age or younger. Yep. Who are, seem to really believe they deserve the job. That's and right. And it reminds me <laughs> that it's actually, you know, a business. It's not necessarily about how I'm feeling. It's yeah. About, and uh, I did know by the time I was offered the chance to show run, which was in season six of Supernatural. I didn't know by that time that like, I was gonna make things work or die trying. Um, I knew that I could kind of hold up under a lot of pressure. And I knew enough to know that was a lot of the job. It was just, it's gonna be many months of unrelenting, unpredictable. <laughs> what yep. about you? Did you know, were you just like, I'm ready? I did think, yeah, I did think I was ready, but I mean, we also had the benefit. I I do feel like this is also where I, I, I talk a lot to young writers because I was a staff writer on quintuplets. I'll hold for applause, um, (laughs) for 22 episodes. Uh Uh, and then I repeated for the first season of how I met your mother for 22 episodes. So I was a staff writer for 44 episodes. Fucked up. You know, but I don't, I loved it. And the reason why is because boy, did I learn a lot. Boy, did I learn a lot. Now people are six episodes as a staff writer and they're a story editor. Like, like I, by the time I was, a, and I got to double bump. So I was never a story editor. I became, I went from staff writer twice to executive story editor, but boy, I was like, okay. Uh, and those two years were huge in my development in in lifting in speaking and feeling comfortable pitching in like and it was big rooms there were 15 person rooms 12 person rooms large rooms mm-hmm. you really didn't have you know i would when we would do little tiny when we would do like two rooms it would be like the a room and the b room and i was in the b room oh what a pressure relief i i could i could almost be a little bit more i could really practice a little bit more in those spaces which was really nice Um, And then I repeated supervising producer four times. So by the time I was doing it the fourth time, I was like, first of all, how am I not a co-EP? Because all of my counterparts obviously had these. Um, And I felt like, oh, I'm I'm like really ready. For those that don't, if you guys don't know the, the, the normal, I mean, I don't know what it, what it, it, if it matters as much anymore, but it used to be staff writer, story editor, executive story editor, co-producer, producer, supervising producer, consulting producer, which would mean the person that's like two to three days a week, uh, co-EP and then EP. Mm-hmm. And so those were normally the things that are worked out in our contracts at the beginning. And, and you have these, you know, th- it used to be three-year deals. I don't know if it is that anymore, where it was, everything was pre, kind of predetermined by the first day that you started in a room. So yeah, I would say, but, and I had seen so many showrunners do things great and do things horribly. So I was like, oh, I definitely think I could do a better job in the chair. I so I felt very that, ready. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you were, <laughs> I get it from the story you just told. I, I, I spent most of my, I did um, 12 episodes of a show that was canceled in five <sighs> when I was a staff writer. And, um, you know, it was the first episode of TV I had written and I was on set and the director disagreed with my choice for a guest star. And I went to my showrunner, who was John McNamara. He was my first boss. Mm. And I was like, but we think it should be the other person. And I think you think it should be the other person. He's like, well, you go tell them. And I'm like, this director who's in his sixties and has directed 400,000 episodes of TV and knows this is my first. And he's like, well, the power comes from me, but it flows through you. Ooh. Ooh. I know, right? That's one of those things that has never left me. Powerful. So I went and I sucked it up and I told him and he rolled his eyes and we cast that person. <laughs> like we had decided, you know, so I was getting a lot. I was being thrown in the deep end as a staff writer, but not not unsupervised. I mean, John knew how to 
give you enough to understand what your job was. And then I was on Supernatural. I understand this is very rare now, but I was on a show that just kept going. going. So, yes. you know, well, you watched the first season of Supernatural and you did all the way up. I did. Yeah. I was like the <sighs> lowest level writer in season one. And because there were a couple of renegotiations, I got like a couple, but I was like an EP in season five, maybe. Okay. Okay. And it was a show that was on the bubble every year. I took staffing meetings and over time, I sort of, I could really write in that showrunner's voice. He and I understood each other. I was, you know, more or less the number two at a certain point. And um, by the way, I was frequently the only woman, you know? Um, <laughs> Same these. Same these. It's, it's why we never got to work together, probably. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so I was as behind the curtain as a producer as anyone was, but so I both felt like resilient, like I had really yeah. climbed my way up the ladder and all, but I mean, but yes, by today's standards, I had like 10 times more experience when I became a showrunner than many showrunners have now. And I'm not saying that to disparage anyone, I'm saying right. that to really empathize. I had done 60 something episodes of that show when he gave me the keys to the car and I still wasn't sleeping for the first four months. I was so terrified. I was going to fuck it up and be fired. So I can't imagine what that would be like with less. Less experience. I know I really feel for, cause I really felt very ready because I had seen wins and so many wins and losses, which was such a benefit. And also, like you said, onset experience, which yeah. a lot, you know, it's one of the things we're fighting for in this, in this negotiation is, you know, many rooms are over and, and the writers do not go to set. And um, I think that's such a loss. And I think it's short sighted in terms of really teaching people, you know, how to do this, this job. There For those that don't know, I, I, people do want Q and A's and I'm sure that that would be good too. I've been saying um, goodbye, but I can't read them and listen to you at the same time. I episode. know. Is there like a specific question portion? Oh yeah, Q and A's. Okay, so there's literally Q and A's. I'll go through some of these, Sarah. But okay. will you share, because <laughs> this is one of my favorite things. What's your favorite quote about show running? Do you have one? Um, sometimes it's your day in the barrel. Oh, that's nice. That's <laughs> nice. I heard one this week that made me laugh so hard. I, it was attributed to Jenji Cohan. I don't know if she said it or not, but it was show running is like a pie eating contest where the prize is more pie. <laughs> so good. I, I heard that so one too. good. Was, like there was an announcement made that I was going to run. It was like in the trades that I was going to run Supernatural. And these showrunners I had met a couple of times, all they emailed me these things. <laughs> I think so Josh good. Who emailed you, me like, sometimes it's going to be your day in the barrel. And I was like, I don't know what that means. And he had to explain it to me. And if you guys want to know what that means, you'll have to Google it. I'm not explaining it. Google it. Google it. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, how do you run, run a room and how is it different than rooms when you started? Oh, that's good. The biggest change was when we went home for COVID. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, like figuring mm -hmm. out. And I, I was like, we were seeing each other on the socials, me and you. Like I saw yeah. you in the robe. Yeah. Yeah. Like, with your writer and Sarah and I really follow each other on social media too. too. I'm like, because you, you know, your fashion is on point. I just, oh, like, Sarah, coming from Sarah. you, uh, darling. Um, uh, I mean, there's, you know, there is something to be said for just experience. And a lot of what that does for me as somebody who is a default anxious person who wants to be on top of everything is that. I just know that more things are on a low simmer. Mm. I'm, I'm more aware of how few true emergencies there really are at any given moment and that more things can wait than you think. Mm. This is something I had to learn. I thought I had to solve everything by the end of the day when I started. That because the, the feeling of being a showrunner is a feeling of like, for this person to do the next piece of their job, you have to say yes or no to the thing that they're showing you now. That's right, that's right. And that's, so you're saying yes or no 500 times a day. And it does give you this feeling of like your day can never end because you have to keep everybody else's train moving. And over time, you start to understand that rhythm better. That's true in the room as well. Of like a writer's room to me, I don't know if it feels this way to you, but to me, it's like, you're just, you're gonna get stuck a lot. You're, everyone's staring at a board. 
you're going to hit walls. You're not going to know how to fix the story. So it works. And the person who's running the room is sort of the symphony conductor of how long are we going to sit in comfort right now? What are the approaches we're going to take to try to solve the problem? And at one point, are we going to like leave it and talk about something else? Mm. So kind of like that's it's navigating. Present. Yeah, it's navigating that. It really is navigating that. Like how long? And I think that's also one work where, where experience helps. Like I've been in rooms where the showrunner, it was two minutes. And I'm like, we could have given this more time, right? And I've been in rooms where it's an hour of silence and staring at a screen. I mean, and people would maybe say something, but it was like, like, please let's move on, you know? So I think that you have to calibrate in you what feels like the right amount of time before you leave it or solve it or come back to it or, you know, um, that, that's a, that's a really, that's a really good one. Okay. Another question. Oh, did you want to? Oh, no. I mean, I'll just say one other thing about it. You know, that thing of like, just know yourself. Like, um, I've always been like, I don't need a ton of care and feeding, but I also don't default to giving. Like I'm not the effusive compliment, sweet girl next door, hug you all the time. So I have to remember (laughs) to do that with people, right? Not everybody is a cactus. Rooms run better when people know they're appreciated. So I do things like bring in trophies and <laughs> and toys. And like, we have like a whole uh, table of random hilarious trophies that I found on Etsy. And like, when people do good pitches, they get that trophy for the day. Just to kind of keep it light. Fun and, fun and funny. You guys wear costumes too, I think. Yeah. Right? Just Free just unicorn just costumes, I've seen them. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's see. Um, what advice would you have for up and coming writers navigating the industry in this moment with a potential writer strike looming? Oof, it's a great question. You know what? We can't control the strike. The people who can control the strike are, I mean, the AMPTP really? It's mm-hmm. like they have to decide what they're gonna, we have to be able to negotiate this. this the, the potential for the strike, in my opinion, is for really good reason. Doesn't it always come down to that though? Yeah, it you know, does. We can control. We can only control what we can control. We're not, we, you and I, and all of the people who are asking these questions, we just didn't go to accounting school. That's right. We are in, we're artists. And then we decided to forge a career in Hollywood. Like it's pretty fucking uncertain. Like what, what do you do when things it's are uncertain? True. It's like, keep your artist self um, like nurtured and whole and listened to and make sure you're doing your art, whether or not other people are telling you you're great or giving you money. Like, mm. That's, I think that's the thing that keeps people. That's going. real. That's yeah. really good. That's really good. Yeah. I think that's, I think that would, that I would, I would say the same thing, like keeping, keeping your artist nourished and continuing to push yourself through these, these unsteady, seemingly unsteady moments. Um, Okay, this is a good one. How many spec scripts do you recommend people have? As many as it takes. The thing about being a writer is you're never, there's never going to be a moment where we're like, congratulations, you've written the script. That means you never have to write a script again. That's, oh my God. Can I do all this now? You signed up to write scripts till you die or move on to another form and do that until you die. That's Um, so good. So just, you keep, there's no such thing as, this is what's, great about being a writer there is no such thing as wasted efforts everything you write is making you a better writer. better that's so true that's so true so keep writing think, you write the thing my my biggest disappointments i will say is that you know i don't always look for a perfect script i i typically look for voice right mm-hmm. like voice is really important to me and so sometimes i'm reading for something i keep a tell i t- i keep an excel spreadsheet of writers that i love that I love the voice. Maybe it wasn't right for one day at a time, but then I would call them in for other things. So what was very interesting to me is staffing one day at a time. And then a few years later, here I'm on. And that was like, I needed family. I needed multi-cam. I needed jokes. I needed, right. That was such a specific thing that we were looking for there. Then for with love, it was like, I'm going to revisit some of these people I really liked. I got sent, sent the same script so many times for writers that I had loved. And I was like, oh yeah, I read this four years ago. Can I have their latest draft? And often there was not a second piece of material. And that to me is insane. Cause I would write something new every year. 
I think with, they often ask for more than one thing. Yes. If, and if it doesn't have to even be a long thing. I will say I got, st I got staffed more on my plays. I would write short plays, one act plays that were like 20 pages. And I got staffed more on my plays than I had specs. I had a new, a new spec I would add every year to the, and then they would kind of rotate them out. Like my Sex in the City spec was my best spec. And I had a, a oh sex, what I, I had sex in the city. I had everybody loves Raymond. I had, uh, uh, what's the one with the, the family on HBO that owns the funeral. Oh, I had six six under. Under. Six six under. And then original an original, an original piece, but then the plays were always original and that's always what would get read first. What were your, what were your specs? It's funny because you and I were, were like exactly the same graduating class, right? Because I had a six feet under and a nip tuck. Oh, that's good. Oh, your nip tuck was probably so good. The CSI, because I just was like, by the way, I was not precious at all. I was like, let me get in anywhere. The, yeah. I'm not sure I would feel this way now. Like, I don't know that I can, I could like go work on a procedural cop show. I just don't think I could no. be in that room now. But back then it was just like, yeah, CSI. Oh, right? yeah. Well, it's also, I think at the beginning, I remember the first meeting I was ever in, they were like, are you a joke person or a story person? And I didn't know. I didn't know. I That's didn't. Thing. You don't actually know what kind of writer you are when you're starting. So you're in there and then you like go, oh, right. I'm really good at this or I'm, yeah, your superpower, right? Like whatever your thing is that you do really well. Um, I, uh, you know, we also wrote half hours. Like it just so happens that our agent thought our half hour was too crazy to send out. And so- <laughs> That was the moment I became a one hour writer, frankly. And then I don't know exactly why Eric Kripke even hired me for Supernatural because our specs were not particularly like that show. I had a lifelong love of horror, so I could speak to that mm -hmm. in the meeting, but I had never written it before. He obviously, whatever he was thinking the day he hired me, it was not, oh my God, this woman can definitely write a bunch of ghosts. Cause I didn't have a sample like that. It was a thing where he sort of, taught me a lot of it and you know once you're in there you can learn that stuff and that's find, right you, find, you know you find out like I found out that nothing makes me happier than like writing a really gory scene where like blood is hitting the lens you don't seem like you really wow, wow. <laughs> zero zero percent like zero percent I tried I just like wrote I just it. wrote an episode of Dolores wrote of the new show that I'm that I'm working on because they wanted me to write it. And every scene I end up with the two the two people in the scene like liking each other. And I was like, I'm, what am I doing? What am I doing here? I'll write everything up until the end where they have to like, where somebody has to kill somebody. That's a gory I, podcast, yeah. I lean, I lean into like, and then they become kind of, and then they kind of find each other and, and understand the other. I mean, it's just, same with procedural. I was horrible. I was a horrible procedural writer. I couldn't care less who the murderer ended up being. But shockingly, give me zombies all day, every day. I love this. I love genre as it turned out and was very surprised. I thought, I mean, I even had a more blanket assessment of myself when I started. I thought I was just bad at structure, right? I thought, and also I had a writing partner. So we were doing, you know, right. we were sort of in a marriage where we were covering different parts of things. But I thought, okay, I'm about character and psychology and ooh, structure. And guess it turns out it's a skill. It turns out you- Turns out it's a skill. That is so good. That is stuff that you get better at. It 100% is. Now, probably because I've done little else but this for the last almost <laughs> two decades of my life, I'll not only go in, like, I'm, I'm really saying this for the people who are watching this, who are like, I'm bad at structure. It's like, now I go in and I go, well, we all know what structure this should be. How are we going to shake it up and do something else instead? Now I really like it. It's a puzzle. It's like doing the crossword. It's true. Now it's yeah. like, how do we, now that I know the, th the thing, how do I mess with it? No, the, and I would say the same is true structure. And I would say the same is true with joke writing. When I started out, I was, I don't think I, I think I was a funny person. A funny person is different than a joke writer. And mm -hmm. so now I can write jokes because I've spent so much time on sets with people that have that skill set, like this joke didn't work, we need three alts. And there would be these guys who would be like, how about this, how about this, how about this, how about this, how about this? And all of them are funny. And you're like, how, how do they do that? And now I can't, I can't, I can't do it for every joke, but for some I can do it. And it's, it's just time put. It's the 10,000 hours, it's a thousand hours, right? 10,000 yeah. hours, that's Malcolm Gladwell. You're probably on like 30,000 hours. Now. I might be on 30,000 hours now. I know it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. All right. Let's see if we can do one sneak, one more question. in. we have three more minutes. You guys have been amazing. Time with Sarah flies by, doesn't it? Isn't she just a goddamn delight? 
Um, oh, tips for pitching, especially for unarticulate or introverted people. It's first of all, it's okay. Not it's everybody okay. is also a beautiful and accomplished actress like Gloria, who's going to walk <laughs> in and, you know, like the people you're pitching to have met a writer before. That's they right. know that we're a package deal. As someone right. once said to me, you have to have a fairly high tolerance for weird to work with writers like people know you it's okay I actually sometimes blank out because I'm nervous when I'm pitching and I go oh this is the part of it where I blank out like I just name it <laughs> so the best advice I can give you is don't be afraid to really rehearse like people who seem off the cuff aren't often aren't that's right and those who are that's their superpower don't worry about them like I I pitched a a show um, uh, almost a couple of years ago now, and I'm about to turn the script, but we won't talk about how long that took. Um, what I would do, because it was just like the dark heart of the pandemic, is I, I wrote a script out for myself. I would put headphones on and take my dog for a long walk and just pretend I was on a call. Mm. And I would just like do the pitch over and over, walking him for 45 minutes twice a day. And that's how I refined the pitch and got it to time. and. Um, I think that's a really I, great, that's so great. Yeah. Write it up like a script and you're the actor memorizing it and you're going to do the best you can. Yeah. And it's also, it's like, it's okay. The thing you have to show them is that, you know, what this show is and you know why you want to make it, you Ooh. know what it is and you know why it's you who like, you would jump off a building to make it. You would like run into a burning building to save it. And however that comes through is fine. They don't need you also to be ready to ship off to the, to like be on late night television today. You That's know? right. They'll That's give you right. media training when your show's a big hit. Guys, this has been one amazing hour with Sarah Gamble. And she also has an incredible pitch your, your amazing, your YouTube series, your tell them your things. Cause this is, um, you can get so much more of her. You and I have this in common that we have this feeling that like we should uh tell people the things that they want to know right yes well important. we can't go to coffee with everybody and i wish i could right and god i made a lot of dumb mistakes and yeah like what is the point of gatekeeping stuff that's just getting there like you'll have enough let's save them time let's save them time from our silly mistakes <laughs> so, yeah so you and i both have done youtube series i interviewed you for mine in 2020, I interviewed a bunch of writers to just like ask you for all your secrets. They can, you can Google me and find it, or it's like linked in all my socials. And every now and again, um, usually when I'm supposed to be writing, I'll put a Q and A box in my Instagram story and just invite people to ask me anything about the business or mm -hmm. writing or what are you stuck on or whatever. And I save those in the highlights um, on my Instagram. So you can go to that too. And um, it's like, as you know, it's a kind of a kick. It's a pleasure to just talk to it's people. It's so nice to talk. Yes, I agree. It's so nice. Guys, what take care up on that. Oh, I have a YouTube. I have a Hollywood 101 on YouTube. It's like 11 episodes, I think, that I did through BuzzFeed's Better Like. And I do, uh, I, I do like Tia Glow in sessions at, on Twitter every once in a while. And even, you can always ask me a question on there because I'll get to it at some point. But re yeah, guys, we're here. We don't die after this moment. So we're around and we're rooting for you. And um, good luck, everybody. Thank you. You're the best. It was so nice hanging. Thanks, Gloria. It's so nice to talk to you.